title this one, Behind, Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Sometimes uh, the term is referenced stuck between a rock and a hard place or caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, happens, right? We all have choices to make. And life is all about decisions and choices, isn't it? So our decisions can yield good, neutral, or bad results in our lives and the lives of others, right? So to be in a very difficult situation and then to have to make a hard decision between two things that are usually equally bad is sometimes referred to as being between a rock and a hard place. A similar term is uh, the horns of the dilemma, between the horns of the dilemma, which of course is, uh, is Greek, di meaning two, lemma, an assumption or a premise. That's a form of argumentation they would use. But again, the same thing. Two points, either one is, is not good, and uh, you're tried, you're in the argument, you're forced to go from one to the other, and there, there's no in-between usually. So, um, you know, biblical characters um, are often caught between the horns of the dilemma or between a rock and a hard place. And I, you remember Jake, Jacob was caught between uh, Laban and Esau, right? That was a scary one, right? Like I said, sometimes both options aren't that appealing. And Daniel was caught between Nebuchadnezzar's demands and God's commands, right? Eat the king's meat deny God's ordinances, or obey God and face death from the king. As well as uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the same thing, right? Same horns, different dilemma. Defy the king or defy God. You know, uh, perish physically or perish eternally, possibly, right? And if we're going to accomplish what God has planned for our lives, which is his will is our sanctification, right? He wants us to be sanctified, blessed, and holy, and live eternally with him. And then we need to know how to make difficult decisions and stand against opposition. So sometimes you have to stand immovable when people or circumstances are coming at you. And other times when the command comes, you have to be ready to pick up and move and follow God, not turning to the left or to the right. And as we think about some of these situations, and I'm sure that a lot of us are thinking about difficult challenges that each of us face in our own lives, I would like us to look together this afternoon at a, a biblical passage where God's people were almost literally stuck between a rock and a hard place. And of course, I'm referring to Moses and the children of Israel as they left the land of Egypt. And the passage is found in Exodus 14. So um, before we get there, I'll set that up a little. So after they left Egypt, the Israelites were headed to the promised land and they left a life of slavery and were looking forward to a better life, you know, free life of, uh, of their physical burdens and then the ability to be with God and, and worship accordingly, this God that they had heard about and some may have worshiped all their days. But suddenly the Israelites found themselves in a um, difficult situation. The Egyptian armies pursuing them from behind. They got hills and mountains on each side of them the Red Sea in front of them, and they're hemmed and locked in like they're caught between a rock and a hard place. And it's a story that I know that all of us have probably heard before and everyone who, uh, almost everyone who will, who will play the video later um, has heard, but it bears repeating because, you know, some 3,500 some years later, we as God's people still find ourselves stuck in some very difficult situations. And sometimes the options seem very limited and the choices aren't very pleasant. With this in mind, I'd like us to consider Exodus 14 as a pattern or blueprint concerning how we should react as God's people. So let's look at the problem and then see how the Lord would have us react. I'm actually going to jump back to Exodus 13 for a moment. So in your notes, Exodus 13, 17 and 18. Because in that previous chapter, we learn the Lord had taken them straight, uh, not straight to the promised land because the Philistines had some huge forts there along the way. And there was no way the Philistines would have allowed them to pass through. And the Lord didn't want the Israelites to get too discouraged and turn back to Egypt, which is interesting. Because then later they ended up in a 
difficult situation anyway, right? So it's like out of the frying pan into the fire type of thing. It's interesting. Um, uh, so uh, Exodus 13, verse 17, it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God had led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God had said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. The Lord knew that even though he was leading them, that if they had to face a fight right away, they would retreat and run. They would doubt the Lord. They would believe their physical senses of what they saw, seeing that strong Philistine garrisons and the powerful armies. Think about that spiritually about you being led out of Egypt and what Egypt represents for us. And you may be guarded from getting into some direct conflicts and, and fights, but he's still going to put you in another situation to work on your faith. Because faith comes first before the fight for holiness. So just something, something neat I saw while I was reading this. Oh, did I? Uh, I didn't read this, so let me read this. <clears throat> so uh, pick it up in verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihaharot, and between Migdal and the sea, over against Balzaphon. Before it shall, shall you encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, and that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So they leave the land of Goshen and the land of Egypt, actually traveling kind of southeast. So uh, they have Egypt to the south and to the west. They have the Mediterranean Sea further up north, Philistines to the northwest, and the Red Sea to the east. Basically totally trapped between a rock and a hard place. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of the Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots on all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand, but the Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen, and his army, and overtook them in camping by the sea, besides Pihaharot, before Balzaphon. And when the Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and said, Behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. Now we remember that Israelites had been slaves in Egypt for several hundred years. They weren't fighters. They weren't a trained army. No soldiers, no weapons to speak of, no military training. I mean, unless they were given some along, you know, when they exited uh, Egypt. They were simply slaves celebrating their freedom, free at last. And then as they start traveling through the wilderness, it ends up like a kind of like a scary movie, you know, where, you know, they the good folks kill the monster or whatever, and they're like, ah, and then there's a, the music dies down, everything's quiet, but you know something's going to happen, right? And boom, all of a sudden, the monster jumps back up or whatever it is, jumps back up. We had a similar thing in, a, in an exorcism, actually, but um, not, to, not to regress and get into that. So the Israelites are rejoicing, right? They're, they're leaving. Hey, man, they saw all this good stuff happen for them, and they look back, somebody looks back over the shoulder and they notice this tiny cloud of dust on the horizon. And then they see the Egyptians getting closer and panic sets in. And the Bible tells us the Pharaoh was leading the charge himself. It says the Pharaoh went his chariot and, and he brought these other chariots with him, 600 of his elite chariots. And all the other chariots of Egypt, it says, an officer in every one, a force that would have required uh, thousands of soldiers, horses. It was a very huge army. Interesting. Remember, the Lord didn't lead them into the Philistines because they had a huge army there. But here, he's doing this for his purpose and his reason. Remember what he said his reason was? We'll, we'll revisit it. 
So the Israelites here are trapped, almost literally a rock and a hard place, and they're terrified. Wouldn't you be? They panicked. Because by human reasoning, they didn't stand a chance. I have on the screen there, fear is false evidence appearing real. The evidence did appear very real. That we're going to get squashed. They're going to eat us up. But that's only because they weren't having faith in their God. Who had already told them what he was doing with them. Here comes the Egyptians. The Red Sea's ahead of them. They got mountains on the other sides. They're locked in. As far as the people were concerned, this Moses man, what kind of leader is that? Man, he totally failed us, right? That's what they're thinking. As they saw it, Moses had led them into, into this, you know, um, closed in spot where they were going to just get crushed. There was no way of escape. So panic and fear overtakes them. And the people complained and they turned on their leader because their, what they thought was their freedom has now turned to uh, return to captivity or worse, death. More than likely, death. So at that point, they turned to bitter sarcasm. And they said unto Moses, because there are no graves in Egypt, has you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore, why have you dealt with us thus to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell you when we were in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Interesting attitudes, right? And you see that, you know, a few times when they reminisce. Oh, remember when we had fish and melons and leeks and onions and garlic, right? Oh, that we could go back. They forgot what the Lord had already done for them, didn't they? They forgot how God had arranged for Joseph to be second in command to Pharaoh. Right? They forgot how God had arranged for Jacob and his sons to be rescued from the famine. Actually, all of the people to be rescued from that famine. They forgot that God had remembered their cries for help in the past. They forgot the ten plagues, the plagues that had allowed them to leave Egypt in the first place. But before we get too tough on the Israelites here, well, let's look at ourselves. We know from our own experience that when we're in a tough spot, it's also hard for us sometimes to remember all the good things the Lord has done for us. This passage then is a reminder, a reminder in our fear, our panic, to look back at all of what God has done and trust Him. In the tough spot of the moment, let's look back at the many other times that God has helped us, just as the Israelites should have done, and to trust in the rock of our salvation. I think of uh, you know David you know, with the Philistine giant, right? Yeah, I killed a lion, I killed a bear. This Philistine's going to be like one of them. The Lord delivered me then. He's going to, how much more is he going to deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine? And that's the kind of faith you need to have. And David against this giant was no different than these folks against the entire army. What the Israelites had failed to realize what God had led them into this specific situation. He told them where he, what he was doing. I'm going to take them this way. At least Moses knew, right? I'm not going to take them that way, lest they repent from seeing war. But I'm going to take them this way so I can get my honor upon Pharaoh and Egypt. The Lord had a master plan. He had orchestrated a setup. The Lord would be honored over Pharaoh because what God was about to be about to do, the Egyptians would know that God is God, that he is the Lord. I think about the fame. Think about the fame that went out um, from this episode. When they end up getting to Jericho, the spies with Rahab, right? What she say? And everyone melts in fear because of you. They, we've heard what the Lord did for you against Egypt. I'd say, you know, that resounds that God got his honor over Pharaoh and Egypt. When we tough our face situations, and let us see this as a possibility. It's possible that we're in a 
a tough situation, maybe as a lesson to us, but maybe as a lesson to other people. As a bold statement to the, the world that, you know, this is how Christians react when faced with difficulty. And I think of Job, you know, and how his friends railed on him. But he was the one who was righteous through it, wasn't he? It was for their benefit as well. But there's also that the Job did receive benefit from it as well. And so can we, through all these situations, even if it's meant for someone else. All of these Israelites benefited from what the Lord said he was going to do on getting honor on Pharaoh. But it was for the Lord's purpose. We're not to be afraid. We're not to panic. We're not to get discouraged by the false evidence appearing real. But they were stuck between the rock and the hard place, so they panicked. And Moses said to the people in verse 13, Fear you not and stand still. See the salvation of the Lord which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. You know, a godly leader will always point people to the Lord. Right? A godly leader will reassure people that God's way is the best way. The only way. Moses knew that the people were scared to death, so he told them to calm down, stand by, and watch. And as we look back at Exodus 14, we move ahead to what the people were told to do. They were told to realize that God is with us, that God is for us, and God is the solution to our problem. And we end up in that same situation a lot, and we forget and do the same thing as those Israelites. And I'm trying to encourage us with this story that we shouldn't be that way that we should stand in the faith of what the Lord has done and promised. And the Lord said unto Moses, in verse 15, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak to the children of Israel, that they go forward. i got the little Strong's up there. I don't know if you can read it um, for going forward. It's Strong's 5265. It means pull up the tent pins. Come on, march. Move it. Get going. And that's what he tells us sometimes too, but not often do we listen. He says to Moses, but lift you up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians that they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots, upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh and upon his chariots, chariots and upon his horsemen. In their wildest dreams, I don't think any of the Israelites could have imagined traveling that they'd be traveling through the Red Sea on dry ground. Was that an option? If they had a brainstorming session how to get out of this, would they ever have come up with, hey, let's have a, the Red Sea part and then we could walk through on dry ground and then flood it onto the Egyptians and get the Lord the honor that he was looking for on this. They would have never thought of it. And that's the way it happens for us sometimes. We are looking to all the physical options. We have to do something. We have to do something. And, and that's true why you need to act. You can't just stand still sometimes, but you have to stand still in the Lord in that if he's already told you something, to follow it. Exactly my point. And Ron pointed out, and uh, uh, I was going to get there, but it's exactly, it, no, it's great. No, perfect. It, he's going to save all mankind by dying on the cross. Who would have thought of that? Our amazing God thought of that. But our ways aren't always his ways, right? We need to make our ways his way. The Lord offers solutions that we would never think of on our own, right? Uh, to Ron's point, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his own love towards us while in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Who would have thought of that solution? Who would have thought of it? I know I wouldn't have. I'm, I'm blessed for it, amazed by it, awed by it, thankful for it. But in response to a life of sin, the Bible says in Acts 2.38, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And whoever would have came up with repentance and baptism as a solution? I wouldn't have thought that. But the great mind of God did. The people then needed to realize 
They can't come up with the answer on their own. That God was the answer to their problem. And God is also the answer to our problems today, every one of them, and every one of us. You know, they started looking at the situation. They started out in the eyes of faith. And instead, if they, if they hadn't been whining, this could have been a whole lot different, right? They could have went, wow, our God is great. Look at the deliverance he gave us from Egypt. You know, the plagues, remember those plagues in Egypt? What was it mean? Remember the death angel, how it took the firstborn? Wow, Man, this is great. All right, mountains on the right, Philistine forts on the left. Uh, the Pharaoh right behind us, bring it. This is going to be great. Let's wait, wait and see what God's going to do. Right? But instead they let that fear, that illusion of these, the things of, of, that are real and tangible interfere with the promises from God. They could have looked at the situation with anticipation. Remember Caleb when they uh, took the land of the giants? What did he say? when all the people were afraid or whatever, he's like, come on, these people are bred for us. We're going to eat them up, man. Let's go. Let's take these giants down, right? Wow. And so, and he's held up as an example of the faith that we're all supposed to have. And, and frankly, we're not in, in these situations where we're facing these physical giants or, or trapped uh, uh, you know, against a sea, against an army. And yet we still fall, and we shouldn't be. We should be learning to walk in faith and walk by faith, not sight. Let's pick it up in verse 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And there was a cloud of darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these. So no one came near the other all night. So on one side, it's all darkness to the Egyptians and it's all light to the Israelites. Pretty cool. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and onto their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels and they drove them heavily. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord is fighting for them against us. Against the Egyptians, it says here. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. All the water's coming in, and they're fleeing. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. A little different than that Charlton Heston version, right? All of them. Pharaoh and all of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. So while that, they're still coming, going through on their half of the the journey there to the other side. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Amen. And so shall we all. As we apply all this to those of us in the church today, it seems that God's basic message has remained the same. And I refer us back to verse 15 where he said, Tell the people, go forward. Go. Lift ourselves up, bear our burdens, and go forward. Some of us may have been burdened down with some attitude issues towards our fellow believers or people outside the church, and that attitude has put you between a rock and a hard place. And the Lord's telling you, go forward. 
Maybe some of you have been camped out in a camp of bitterness or laziness or, or anger. And the Lord's again saying, pull up your tent pegs and get going. Don't dwell there. Camp, camp slacker. <laughs> if you haven't been giving, I always say if you don't open up your hand to give, you can't receive God's blessings either. If you're not giving, reach out to the poor in your community. But always be sure to give the gospel because that satisfies forever, not just meeting your physical needs. It's okay to do nice to them, but they're still going to perish without the salvation that you have. Step out of your comfort zone and do it. Pull up the stakes. Go forward. If you haven't been resisting sin in your own life and fighting the good fight, God says, don't stay there. Move. Spiritually speaking, if we're stuck in a rut, maybe we've stopped growing as we should. And the Lord's saying to us this afternoon, get moving. Start doing something about it. He's ready to lead us all on a continuing journey. But there's a step, an important step, that is up to us to obey. A time to stop just crying out to God and pull up the tent stakes and move as he commands us to move and go forward towards the promised land. One of my favorite verses here is verse 30. Um, I, I know it sounds a little morbid, but uh, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. But I was thinking what an interesting end for Pharaoh and the Egyptian army. Do you remember when Moses first came on the scene? In Exodus 1, Pharaoh commanded all the midwives to take all the newborn baby males and drown them in the Nile River. And 80 years later, now the Pharaoh and his armies are drowned in the Red Sea. I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, uh, we read, uh, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap in Galatians 6, 7. He pulled Moses and his people out of the water, and that's Moses' name, drawn from the water. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. What a memorable picture that might have been for the Israelites at that time. Yeah, Noah being saved. Baptism. Again, who would have thought of that and put it in the plan of salvation? Our God would. God will provide a way to get the job done, but we have to have the courage to trust Him and move. To go forward. So stop to think about maybe your own struggles. What are we facing now? And have we experienced God's help in the past? If we have, can God do it again? Sure He can. In this history we read together that, I mean, we have a lesson preserved for us by God. When God tells us something in his word, then we're confronted with terrors in our thoughts and physical senses so much that the fear overwhelms us and it seems there's no way out, then consider that fear is merely false evidence appearing real. Believe God. He usually speaks first, too. Right? Don't eat of that tree. Oh, he he does. He just says, you know, that you won't die. Don't worry about it. Right? God spoke first. Adam and Eve should have listened. Right? And we should listen. And He's empowered us through the Spirit, Holy Spirit that we we can obey. If we're in Christ, we will be. God already showed His power to, here to Israel. He told them what he was doing. God took care of them throughout, even when they were tempting him. They, even, they knew back then, and they somehow forgot, that the impossible was I'm possible with God. Right? God is the answer to our problems. Stand by and see the salvation of, of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. We also understand that sometimes we have to pull up the tent stakes and move to take that important step that God has told us to take in His Word. 
couple more examples of this, if I can take us into Exodus 17. You know, this is when they were thirsty for water, and we'll read both accounts of that. The Numbers version will come up next. All the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Think of the situation. Has God always been taking care of them and rescuing them? Why would they think he would just let them die of thirst? Dehydration, right? But the physical senses and those urges are overwhelming the truth of the matter, right? And the faith that they're supposed to have in God. And that happens to us too, but we have to be aware of it so we can overcome it. There was no water for his people to drink. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people there thirsted for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Why, Wherefore is this that you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? There they go again. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They're being almost ready to stone me. Wow, are they far away from... You don't know what spirit you are of, right? And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with you of the elders of the Israel and thy rod wherewith you smote the river, take in thy hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee on the rock at Horeb, and you shall smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, so the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they had tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And again, before you judge the Israelites, turn around and look at yourself. And maybe repentance is required when you take that look in that spiritual mirror. Just look at the Numbers version. Where's their faith, right? But the Lord says the same thing about us. Where's your faith? Didn't Jesus say it to his disciples after doing what he did, all the miracles and stuff he did before them? Oh, you have little faith. And when I return... Will I find faith on this earth? That scares me. I've said that before up here. It does. Man, I wanna, I'm going to strive for that faith. I'm going to strive for that faith. And faith is a fruit of the Spirit. So if I abide in Him, I can be guaranteed it's, it's coming. It's there. I will have that faith, and I will be able to draw upon it in those times of need. Which for me is every day, actually. So let's pick it up verse 1 here in Numbers 20. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Who are they really against? God. And the people chode with Moses. That's a new word for me, chode. Chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Right? And they were probably thinking about either the plague, the pestilence there, or maybe when Korah's rebellion. Um, but they're like, man, it would have been better for us to die then. So again, they're not trusting that the Lord, the Lord didn't have to, but to his promise, he came and delivered them. And he did the same thing to us. He didn't have to, but he came and delivered us. And yet, we still don't always trust him that he is leading us to our sanctification, to our promised land, to walking in holiness with him forever. And we sometimes turn back. Oh, no, we're always going to be this way. Let's go back to, the, to our ways of Egypt. It's a warning. Why have you brought us up out of the why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us unto this evil place? In no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. That's amazing in itself. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take the rod and gather you the assembly together, you and Aaron your brother, and speak to the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth water. And you shall bring forth to them water out of the rock, so you shall give the congregation and their beasts to drink. 
And Moses took the rod before him as the Lord, before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their beasts also. And the Lord spoke unto man, Moses and Aaron, Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Wow. You could see that even the, even the leaders are forced with that same faith question, that rock in that hard place. Right? Moses had already knew he, I mean, he, although he could stand in the gap for them, he knew that whoever sins against the Lord is the one who gets punished, right? And here he was told to speak to the rock, and he, he, he hit the rock and kind of intruded on God's glory a little bit there. Must we get you this, right? He was angry. But, and we can end up in these situations too, both as the people and the, and the leaders and the leadership, is that, um, I mean, we all have to have that faith and model that faith, even when times are tough, even more so when you're a leader, right? So the people look to the elders and they look to the apostles, for example, to be their examples. So uh, parents, you know well that you have to be a living example to your children, right? You could teach with your words, but we teach far more by our example. And uh, verse 13, which I don't have on screen there, says this is the water of Meribah because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. The Lord still was sanctified. He still provided the water for the people too, didn't he? Because he loves them and he cares for them. This is our pattern as well, where we don't give our honor to the Lord for what he has done and what he has promised us. And we're so quick to turn and doubt. You know, um, red flag on the play. When a head coach on a, like a football team perceives that the referee made a wrong call, he throws out a red flag. And this flag single, signals that the referee needs to review the play again. The coach obviously believes that the referee made a mistake. And there's times in our lives, especially when we're caught between a rock and a hard place, when we want to throw out the red flag on God. We want to stop the game, throw down the flag, because it looks like God made a wrong call. He missed something. Basically, you're saying he didn't know what he was doing, because if he did, he wouldn't have done it this way to me. He wouldn't have put me in between the Red Sea and these Egyptians. And maybe only subconsciously, but we may think thoughts, if God really cared, he wouldn't put me in this situation. If God had known how this was going to affect me, he wouldn't allow that thing to happen. If he had really known the pain that I was going to have to go through in dealing with this, he would have made a different choice if he, if he loved me like he says he does. And sometimes those are subconscious thoughts, and it's manifest in our actions. Some of the times it seems that we want to reach into our pocket, pull out that red flag, and throw it down. And say, God, you missed this one. Re rewind it, review it. Like Job, remember Job said, I wish there was a referee between me and you. Right? Wow. <laughs> but we do that same thing. But we need to remember at times like those that God does some of his best work in the realm of the unseen with the impossible, because there's nothing impossible with God. He's often the nearest to us when he seems the furthest away. And it's during those times that our faith needs to be solid to carry us through. Because it's often in those times that God is waiting to see what we will do. When your physical senses seem to conflict with what God says, trust God. And you have to follow through, like he did with the manna in the wilderness, right? Don't go out and gather on the sixth day. It's not going to be there. On Friday, gather to double. 
here I'm going to rain manna from. These are all, all miracle stuff that they needed to have faith in, but they tested him even along the way in that. Well, look, he's been throwing manna at me all week. Somehow, I don't believe he's going to not, you know, he's going to provide me double on Friday for Saturday, so I'm going to go out and try and gather it. Or maybe that means I didn't go and try and gather double. Or, you know, we allow our physical needs, and God knows what we need, have need of, right? There's scriptures to tell us that, right? He closed the, the, you know, the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. How much more does he care for you? And, and in those moments, in that heart rock and the hard place, it seems that we forget how much he really does care for us and love us. Trust God. When your senses conflict, trust God. He gave you those senses to begin with. So he knows what you're going to see. He knows those challenges you're going to have. And he says, choose me. There was a, a missionary to China more than 50 years ago. She lived uh, 1902 to 1970, Gladys Alward. And she was forced to flee when the Japanese in, invaded Yangchen. But she could not leave her work behind. And with only one assistant, she led more than 100 orphans over the mountain towards free China. And in their book, um, it was called The Hidden Price of Greatness by Ray Bassan and Renelda Mac Hunsaker. They tell what happened. They said, During Gladys's harrowing journey out of war torn Yang Chen, she grappled, grappled with despair as never before. After passing a sleepless night, she faced the morning with no hope of reaching safety. A 13 year old girl in the group reminded her of their much loved story of Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. But I am not Moses, Gladys cried in desperation. Of course you're not the girl said, but Jehovah is still God. When Gladys and the orphans made it through, they had proved once again that no matter how inadequate we feel, God is still God, and we can trust in him. When the situation seems impossible, just remember to have that personal confidence in God, practice obedience to God, and understand that God has a purpose in all the experiences that we have with him. Trust him. Don't listen to other voices especially your own, because you talk yourself out of his promises way too quickly. Have faith and do not doubt. That's what the scriptures tell us. We shouldn't be surprised that trouble comes knocking when we, come, when we decide to follow God and focus on his promises, right? In this life, you will have tribulations, Jesus said. And you have an enemy. The devil doesn't want us to go forward with God. And he's going to do whatever he can to get us to quit or fall back into your destructive habits. Oh, that I can go back into Egypt. Think spiritually now. Oh, that I can go back into Egypt. Do these things that I used to get and do in Egypt. I didn't worry about them. I didn't have that conscience about them then. It's during times like that that we need to keep our focus on the Lord. And remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15. But thanks be to God, which is giving us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Saying that we'll stand firm, I guess that's an easy statement, but it's much harder to do when things are coming against you. Oh, you don't know what I'm going through, right? It's not always easy to stand firm when you feel the enemy's throwing everything at you and you feel you're standing alone but you are not alone at, at that time many people want to cut and run they want to leave they want to go back to egypt being a christ follower is too hard but jesus said my burden's light who are you going to believe your senses or christ half the battle for us can be just staying in a position we have to learn in our faith to stand where what he's called us to do and what he's, where he's placed us, no matter how difficult it's get, it gets. And one thing is for certain is that he has called us to holiness, to be sanctified, to be like him, to be like his son. Everyone encounters obstacles. Everyone in the sound of my voice, you may be going through something right now 
Where do we stand when that adversity you know, hits us, when it comes? And lots of times it seems worse than an Egyptian. I'd rather face an Egyptian army in the, in the Red Sea than this, right? And you feel like you're alone in it. But you're not. You have to realize that God has a plan to take care of you. And it may be, you know, going through the fire. It, it just may be for you or for someone else. I think, again, uh, you know, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, stepping into that furnace heated seven times hotter than normal. That thing was blazing. All right, that, that's pretty fearful, right? They could have just like held, held their hand over a campfire and that would have been scary enough. But we're going to heat this up and we're going to throw you in there if you don't, you know, fall in worship. Our God can save us. We know he cares about us enough. But you know what? If he chooses not to, we're still not going to transgress his commandment and bow down to your idol. That's the same thing that we do when we choose sin over God is we decide to worship that idol instead. And that fire would consume us then. But they chose rightly and that fire didn't consume them. Isaiah 55, uh, 8 through 11, and we referred to this a little earlier, said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that be go forth out of my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Just like Moses and the Egyptians. He said his word. He said he was going to get his honor upon the Egyptians. He said he was promised the Israelites he was going to lead them out into that land where they could be free to worship him. All those promises came true despite the lack of the, the, the people's faith. That they leaned towards the, what they were seeing with their senses and hearing with their ears and feeling in their hearts. If we focus on the natural realms, things will look hopeless a lot. And it seems to be a cycle. And you'll be okay for a while and bam, another fire, another tribulation comes. The Israelites only saw the Red Sea in front of them and the Egyptians behind them. They couldn't see any way out. But God had made a way of escape. It was an impossible way. They wouldn't have thought of it. But they didn't need to think of it. All they needed to do was trust him. And that's the same thing with us and our problems. You trust him and he'll take you through it. He may rescue you from it or persevere you through it. Again, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. They had, to, they had to go in the fire. But he was there with them. And not one hair on their head was singed. That's the kind of faith we need to have. And I tell you, lots of times that we're failing, we're not, fa we're not faced with the same type of thing physically. But I would challenge you to think that we are faced with the same thing spiritually. There's no such thing as a small spiritual decision. If we focus on the impossibilities, the further down we'll go. But when we start to look at the possibilities of God, healing, right? Deliverance. The overcoming of the flesh. All those things that seem impossible on our own, God has already told you you have victory over. Through the Spirit. He's already told you that. He has a plan of victory and triumph for us. Are we no different than the Israelites encamped at uh, McDonald's by the Red Sea? Not McDonald's, McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> That's a rock and a hard place. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, verse 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And how often do we think that he's abandoned us? To, if we don't think he's planned evil for us, that we think he's abandoned us. But he thinks good thoughts towards you. Thoughts of peace. 
Even if you have to go through tribulation, he doesn't leave you alone. He says, then you shall call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me and you shall search for me when you shall search for me with all your heart and I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. Think of that spiritually. Sin used to be your, your captive, your um, master, your slave owner. It's no more. Romans 6, 7 and 8. And I will gather you from all the nations and all the places wherever I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again to the place where I caused you to be carried away captive. But we have a part to play. God allows us that part to play in our victory. We get to determine if we're going to be a victim or a victor. A faith failure or a faith giant. If we feel like we're beaten down by circumstances, burdened by cares, gripped by fear, weighed down by the grind, be of good cheer, as Jesus said. And like Moses said, don't be afraid. That's the same thing Jesus said you know, to the disciples you know, multiple times. Don't be afraid. Remember who you are in Christ. I think you forget sometimes. The flesh makes you forget. The world makes you forget. The devil makes you forget. Remember who you are in Christ. And be obedient and courageous because God said he's with us. And then we can move into the promises of God, our promised land. And those impossibilities not only become possibilities, they become guarantees. Promises of God. Has anybody heard the story about Aaron Ralston? Aaron Ralston was a mountain climber um, in Aspen, Colorado. They made a movie about his book. The movie's called 127 Hours with James Franco. And uh, he wrote the book Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Back in uh, April of 2003, he was having some fun doing the extreme sp sport of canyoneering which is basically hiking and climbing up and then down a rugged remote terrain, usually narrow passages in the rock, using rock climbing gear. He had done solo winter expeditions by himself. He went to the summit of 49 of uh, Colorado's 54 peaks that are 14,000 feet and above. Back in 98, he was doing this a long time, so he was very experienced. So he figured a few hours hiking down Blue John Canyon in southeastern Utah's Canyon Land National Park would be like a walk in the park. But something went badly this time for Aaron. It was on a Saturday that Aaron was moved, moving through a three-foot-wide slot canyon, and he pushed his arm into a crack in the canyon wall, and an 800 to 1,000-pound slab of stand, sandstone, a boulder, shifted, broke loose, and fell, crushing his right hand and fore, forearm, pinning him in horrifying, excruciating pain. And he was locked in, couldn't move. He tried to use his ropes and his anchors to free himself, but he couldn't budge that massive boulder. Day turned to night, hours turned into days, and he was familiar with danger. He had narrowly escaped an avalanche just back in February or that same year. But he was forced to wait for help that more than likely wouldn't arrive. He was in a slot canyon, even if they were flying overhead. What's the chance of them seeing him down there? By Tuesday morning, he had completely exhausted his water supply. And by Thursday morning, after five agonizing days of forced standing, because he's locked in with a boulder, so even if you can sleep, you're standing in the unforgiving elements, the heat and cold. He realized at that point that drastic measures would have to be taken if he was going to survive. So he had two choices as the sun rose over Blue John Canyon on Thursday morning. He could die with his arm trapped beneath the massive old boulder alone in the desert. Or he could amputate his right arm with his own pocket knife. What would you choose? <laughs> well, because of his strong desire to live, 
Ralston was able to tie a tourniquet to his right arm and then do the unthinkable. You never, right? You never know until you're put in those situations what you'll do. He had to sever his crushed limb just below the elbow with his own knife. You know, and I listened to his explanation of it. And, you know, he described having to, he first he said his, his hand was so swollen up from the, it was decaying. He was locked in. It was basically dead for four or five days. And he said he stuck his knife into the thumb and he couldn't feel it. And he heard gases escaping. Right. And then a little bit of blood had come out and then he had he had cut through um, the, the, the meat. Well, first he realized he, I mean, he was a mechanical engineer, so he, he understood I have to I can't cut through the bone with that little knife. So he had to actually use his arm like a, a lever because he was an engineer. He understood leverage and he, he had to snap the two bones in his arm first so he can cut through it. And the thing he cut through laugh was the nerve bundle. Once the grim task was done, he found a way to set up his climbing ropes and hooks, and he rappelled 60 feet straight down a rock wall to the canyon floor, where he began the long trek back to his vehicle. And that's where the rescuers found him, found him on that Thursday afternoon, bloody, dehydrated, staggering along a stream. What was left of his right arm was wrapped in a tourniquet, and he was about two miles still from his car. He had already walked seven miles with his wound. He was quickly airlifted out of the canyon by a rescue uh, helicopter to St. Mary's Hospital in Grand Junction, Colorado. Authorities and medical experts had said if Ralston had not caught off his arm to free himself, he would have surely died from either dehydration, exposure, or the effects of his limbs being crushed. But what were such drastic measures really necessary? Yes. We know he would have died from his injuries. What if he would have just postponed his tough decision? Wouldn't have somebody just found him and then they could have helped him? Like I said, he was in a narrow slot canyon. Chances are they wouldn't have found him. And if he waited, he would have just died there. The rescue uh, helicopter pilot said if Ralston had not made the decision to cut off his own arm, he would have never survived. He said uh, on an ABC News broadcast, he said, where Aaron was pinned, we went back in there and looked at the spot he was pinned, and it was such a narrow canyon, and the overlap was so bad that we would have flew directly over the top of him, and we still wouldn't have seen him down there. And uh, the spokesman for the Canyonlands National Park in Utah said he reached a point where he knew he could die with an arm, or live without one. Now, Aaron is not a, a, a professed Christian. As a matter of fact, in interviews, he had said that he prayed to the devil and God. He didn't care who would save him. Afterwards, he does say he believed it was God and how he pictures God to be. But he was right in saying it was a decision of, of basically of faith and of works. To live, he had to follow through on what he knew he needed to do. And Aaron Ralston, like few others, could quite literally explain what Jesus meant when he made this graphic, gruesome statement in Matt 5.30. And if your right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of your members should perish and not, not that their whole body should be cast into Gehenna hellfire. The NLT reads it this way. And if your hand, even if it's your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell or Gehenna. No, Jesus wasn't talking about mountain climbing accidents. He wasn't even really referring to the physical body. He was, however, speaking of a life-threatening injury that every person here has experienced. The wound of sin that traps us alone in our own personal slot canyon in the wilderness. 
And without taking drastic measures, sin in any form will be fatal to you. I'm going to read this in fuller context for your notes, Matthew 20, uh, 5, 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever is looking on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if your right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and that not that your whole body should be cast into Gehenna. And if your right hand offends you, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body should be cast into hell. The repetition of the same form of warning has in part an emphasis of iteration, but it points out a distinct danger. Not the senses only through which we receive impressions, but the, the gifts and energies which issue in action may become temptations to evil. And in, if that case, a choice has to be made, it's better to forfeit them and to have salvation. The true remedy, of course, is not in cutting off your arm or plucking out your eye, but directing your will, your free will that you have, through the Spirit, to that each, each the eye and the hand may do their work in obedience to the law of righteousness. And that's made possible through the Spirit that is in you if you are abiding in Christ. The point of these two verses is our salvation is to be preferred before all things. Would you cut off your arm to inherit eternal life? Salvation is to be preferred no matter how precious the thing lost may seem to you at the time. Walking by faith, not sight. If you have to lose an appendage to save the whole body, then amputate, man. How much more should it teach us to part with anything that will compromise or endanger our salvation? That's what it's supposed to teach us. And yet I still see people wandering in circles in the wilderness and not picking up and moving their tent when God tells them to move. When it speaks of cutting off members, it refers to sin, not our eyes, hands, or feet. Your eyes, hands, or feet can't commit sin by themselves only when driven by your wicked heart. So that should concern you if those things are happening because that means there's wickedness in your heart. And God says he will change your heart. He will renew your mind. Sin begins in the mind, James 1.14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Here's the members where to cut off. Colossians 3, 5, and 6. Mortify or kill, therefore, your members, which are on this earth, doesn't mean people in the church. It calls out sins as your members. This is what Christ was referring to, pluck out your eye or cut off your arm. Cease from sin. Cease from sin. This is the stuff, where, and, and again, and I, I'll, I'll stand alone if I have to, but I, I have been fighting a battle at for, I guess for years in the ministry, that we need to walk in holiness. And many naysayers will say, oh, no, no, but we all sin. That, you know, that may be true, but when you say that, if you're allowing that to make you not fight, and yeah, you sin and you repent, sin and repent, do you think God's happy with that? Do you think you're using everything in your power that God has given you to resist that sin? I'll tell you you're not. And you're not fighting the good fight. And I don't care if I stand alone in that, because I know I'm not alone. I'm with him. I want to encourage us to be the holy people that we are called to be, because it's possible. Your salvation isn't contingent on you being perfect, okay? So take that excuse off the table. That doesn't mean you're not called to fight and to be holy. And when he says do something, you do it. He says mortify your members on the earth, which are these, fornication. That includes adultery. That includes uh, surfing porn, and the word is porneia there, uncleanness, which is any impurity, inordinate affection, which is in the Greek is pathos, passion, or, or, or even drama, living in that emotional uh, world like that, evil concupiscence, which is wicked lust or illicit desire, and covetousness, which is greed and avarice. All of that is idolatry. 
you're worshiping something other than God. And that's what he says to do. This isn't, again, it's not Second Ken, verse 3. And he even warns us, if you're doing these things, this is the same things that the wrath of God is coming. That's a promise too. Coming on the children of disobedience. Romans 8, 13, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify, again, kill the deeds of the body. Again, not cutting off your arm, but directing your hand to do the thing that's right. If you used to steal, now give. Right? The put off and put on principle that we've taught many times. The deeds of the body mean our inward lusts. If we snuff them out there, We'll have no need of mutilating ourselves by amputating body parts, would we? Additionally, through these instructions about cutting off a member, I think Christ is also teaching us the principle of marking members of the body and disfellowshipping them for sin. You remember Paul and the man in Corinth who was committing fornication? Paul compared sin to leaven. Um... I think that's Second Corinthians. I don't know where. It's First Corinthians, right? Yeah. Your glorying's not good. You know, a little leaven leavens a whole dump. So he says, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. So if God tells them to take one person who is fornicating in the body and cut them off from life, if you're cut off from the church, you're cut off from life. Until you repent, and he had the opportunity to repent and come back. Again, God's grace and mercy and blessing. If, if God says that so strong, why do you think it's okay for you to continue in sin? Again, the scriptures are countless, and they all add up. But sometimes we're believing our physical senses, just like the Israelites at the Red Sea. Let's go back to Egypt, because I can't stop doing these things I do. I do them all the time. Well, stop it. He said, stop it. In many ways and many times, he said, stop it. Again, salvation is your free gift. Again, take that off the table. That's your free gift. Now do what he tells you to do and he empowers you to do. I'm not angry. I am passionate about it, though. If you can tell. <laughs> Hebrews 12, 1 through 4 says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does easily beset us. Oh, look, it says the sin easily besets us. Yes, but it also says lay it aside and run with patience the race that is set before us. Pick up your tent pegs and move. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, looking way ahead, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Again, amputation. Cut off your limb. It doesn't mean physically do that. But you need to fight the good fight and resist. And that's a rock and a hard place that we're at. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? If you play with fire, you'll get burned. If you play with sin, you will be destroyed. It's never worth it in the end. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's what death pays you. Or sin pays, pays you is death. The wages of sin, what you get paid of sin, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's only one way that sin is faithful. Its reward is always death. Always. But sin won't share that secret with you while you're in it. Sin instead promise you riches, fame, pleasure, fulfillment, power, whatever. And while you may experience some of those along the way, it's only fleeting. There is pleasure in sin for a season. But in the end, everyone's going to stand before that judgment bar of Christ. 
And then the real payday comes. And the results are the same. The wages of sin is death. Natural and spiritual. Actually, sin brings death right from the start. It always kills something in us when we transgress. It assaults our sensitivities. It calluses us against you know, being so horrified at sin. I always think of that Time Changer movie um, when, um, and if you haven't seen it, uh, see it. And It's the Christian Time Changer one, Gavin McLeod and somebody else in there. Um, there's many movies by that name, so get the right one. But when the man from the 1800 seminary goes back, goes forward in time, and then he goes to a movie theater to see just a normal movie or whatever, and he's horrified, absolutely horrified, that they used the Lord's name in vain in the movie. And he came out and said, stop the movie, stop it. And he was so passionate for the Lord. And it should make us think, why aren't we that way? Why doesn't it bother us? Because we've grown calloused from that sin, even witnessing it. That's why, I, I mean, it's really good to you know, either understand something's a bad example or to don't watch it. Because sin will maul your willpower. It will defile your body. Every time you sin, something hardens or dies in you. And in the end of the road, at payday and judgment day, the wages of sin is death. We mentioned this verse earlier, Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. God isn't mocked. He, he won't be mocked. He's told you these things. He's told you the end from the beginning because that's that's what God does. Whatever a man is sowing, that is what he will reap. If you sow to the flesh, corruption, that's death. If you sow to the Spirit, an incorruptible spirit body. It takes drastic measures to get rid of sin. And it can be very painful but it's way worth it. You can't wean yourself away gradually. Well, just a little less, a little less. You, in your mind, you have to be made up already that I'm not playing around with sin. I'm amputating it like this. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. I'm amputating. Yeah. Spiritually speaking, of course. You have to do something even more courageous than Aaron Ralston did in that canyon back in 2003. Are you ready to stand up and be courageous? You have to die to yourself. Die to that old nature that you supposedly put to death in the waters of baptism. And there's a wonderful rescue waiting for every person who makes that tough decision. And not just a physical rescue like Aaron Ralston. Colossians 2, 10 and 11 says, You are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You're forgiven those past sins and you're also empowered with the Spirit to walk in holiness. You do have a safety net. I'm not saying don't jump into the safety net every day. Have some respect and honor for the Lord and what He's done for us. And follow what He says. Remember, next time you're between a rock and a hard place, choose the rock, right? Greater is He that's in you than he that is in the world. You can do all things through Christ. He loves you and He strengthens you and He protects you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become as new. How many scriptures do we need to understand what God wants for us? He wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. If you walk by sight or your senses concerning sin, you are going to return to Egypt every time. You're going to cry out, but you're not going to move the way He tells you to move. He's telling you ahead of time how to move. 
Abide in Christ. Walk in the Spirit. And you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Thank you.